Thomas Ray. So it's a great honor to be with you today. Um, I have to begin by saying that I, in the steel industry, I'm the outsider. But uh, sometimes the outsider opinion has, has value, so we'll, we'll try to make sure that happens today. I want to start with the story about, in 1970, a Russian team went to uh, the Kola Peninsula in Russia, which is just off of Finland, and they started drilling a hole straight down. Now, they started drilling this hole straight down for 24 years, and this became known as the, the Kola Super Deep Borehole. After 24 years, they got 12.2 kilometers deep, and this is the deepest hole ever dug on the surface of the Earth. But they ran into temperatures of 220 degrees Celsius. It started getting gooey, and they couldn't dip drill anymore, so they finally gave up. So this is what remains of this effort today. There was lots of research being done at the time. Uh, 24 years, they worked on this project. And this is what the hole looks like today. It's about this big around. And uh, the researchers actually thought it was haunted because strange things were happening there. But the center of the Earth is actually 6,300 and 57 kilometers straight down, and all we've gotten is about 12 kilometers down. So we don't really know what's in the center of the Earth. Um, lots of interesting possibilities if we think about going that far down there. So we tend to be blinded by what we think we know. So are we destined to probe the Earth's core? What would we find down there? What kind of mineral reserves would be down there by sending probes to the center of the Earth? We have no idea. So what other ways can we use information like this? Well, we tend to be a very backward-looking society. We're backward-looking because it's just human nature. See, we've all personally experienced the past. As we look around us, we see evidence of the past all around us. All information that we come into contact with is essentially history. So the past is very knowable and yet we're going to be spending the rest of our lives in the future, so it's almost as if we're walking backwards into the future. As a futurist, my job is to help turn people around, to give them some idea of what the future might hold. So how does the future get created? Well, the future gets created in the minds of everybody around us. Certainly some of us have more influence in creating the future than others, but people make decisions today based on their interpretation of what the future holds. So I use this phrase quite a bit, the future creates the present. This is just the opposite of what most people think. Most people think that what we're doing today is going to create the future, but from a little different perspective, the visions in our head determine our actions today. So here's the key thing. If we change somebody's vision of the future, we change the way they make decisions today. So that's my promise to you today. So I'm going to change your vision of the future, and as a result, you'll walk out of here making other decisions. If I don't do that, please hold my feet to the fire, okay? Uh, I do have a disclaimer, though. Um, I, as a futurist, I get asked a lot if I have a crystal ball, and yes, I do have a crystal ball. It was sitting around at home, and uh, my wife says, why don't you just take this to work? It's just collecting dust. So reluctantly, I, I went ahead and I put it in the car, and I was driving down the road. I was no more than about four or five minutes down the road. I looked over and I saw that the crystal ball had started to fire on the seat next to me. Um, with the sun shining in, the crystal ball is a giant lens, and so it started to fire next to me. Uh, luckily, I was able to put, put the crystal ball crystal ball fire out. Um, but then I had this grand revelation. The revelation was, and obviously it came from my crystal ball, was that uh, the newspaper headlines the next day were going to say, futurist killed by his own crystal ball, and he didn't see it coming. So, so that's, that's my disclaimer. I don't see everything. Larry Page um, the chairman of, of Google Alphabet right now, 
that says that the main reasons companies fail is because they miss the future. I happen to agree with that. So let me talk to you about a technology we don't hear much about, is the atmospheric water harvesters. Um, this is a technology for sucking moisture out of the air. Now we always think about using pipelines to transit water. We use, uh, we get water from lakes and from groundwater, but we don't ever think about using the atmosphere as a conduit for moisture. Uh, this is a dew collecting greenhouse in Ethiopia. This is what's referred to as the work of water towers. They get around oh, 100 and, uh, 125 liters a day, depending on the humidity. This has changed the lives of lots of young ladies in Africa because they're the ones that have to haul all the water. And they're teaching them how to actually build these, these units quickly. Eoli Water is a French company that's figured out how to use a windmill for pulling water out of the air. They're testing this out in Abu Dhabi. A young gentleman, Edward Linegar, has figured out how to use solar-powered units to actually suck moisture out of the air and irrigate plants next to it. Now, the whole time that this work was going on, the, the holy grail of this industry was to try to, to see if we could create a self-filling water bottle. Can we actually create a water bottle that fills itself? And uh, a few months back, this company, uh, Fontas actually created that, one that fits on a bicycle, and it sucks moisture out of the air while you ride your bicycle. This is a water bottle that fills itself. It's called the Fontas, and it's supposed to be able to pull water out of the air as you ride a bike, filling up over the course of an hour. Designer Christoph Redesart made the Fontas to address the lack of safe drinking water in many areas of the world. Fresh water is something we constantly take for granted. Of the over 7 billion people on Earth, 783 million don't have access to clean water. Even in the United States, areas like Flint, Michigan are struggling with water contamination. It's hoped that designs like the font... So this goes on to say that this isn't the perfect solution, that the water isn't totally clean when it comes out of the air, but it's on the right, right path. William Gibson, the famous science fiction author, says the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Now. Atmospheric water harvesters are what I refer to as a catalytic innovation. Now this is different than disruptive innovation. Disruptive innovations disrupt existing industries, forcing people to do more with less. Catalytic innovations create entire new industries. So examples in the past of catalytic innovations, things like electricity, automobiles, airplanes, uh, telephones, photographs, each of these have gone on to create multi-billion, actually multi-trillion dollar industries over the years and there's a lot more that could be added to this list. But here's the key thing is all industries are a bell curve. They have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Yes, all industries will eventually end. A thousand years from now, all the industries we have here today will have been replaced several times. The other key thing is that most of the profitable industries today happen to be in the second half of the bell curve. They're constantly being forced to do more with less. So every industry has a peak, and so when do we reach the peak of these different industries and start to decline? So how long before we reach peak steel? We don't know yet, but we think that there's a long run here before we reach that point. One of the key predictions that I made several months ago is that by 2030, over two billion jobs are going to disappear. I end up getting quoted on this in newspapers and television stations and magazines literally all over the world. Now, when I made this prediction, it wasn't intended to be a doom or gloom statement. It wasn't intended to say that we're gonna have two billion people unemployed in the world. It was intended to be more of a wake-up call to say that we're going to have to um, reskill people and create new jobs at a faster rate than ever before. This is what I refer to as the level problem. Now, most of us have this tool in our, our garage, in our home, and we use it for hanging pictures, and we use it for doing carpentry work. But once we download a mobile app, 
that does the same thing, then we don't need to buy as many of these, these tools. That means we don't need to make as many of the aluminum frames, we don't need to have as many of the glass bulbs, we don't have to have as many people working to do the assembly work, the shipping, the receiving, the retail work on the retail end. So every time we download a mobile app, we eliminate a little piece of a job. It's a very tiny piece, but when we're downloading billions upon billions of mobile apps, we're eliminating lots of jobs. Oxford, uh, a few months back, went through and analyzed over 700 different jobs, and they concluded that over the next two decades that machines will take over roughly 47% of all, all of those of today's jobs. Coincidentally, that works out to right around two billion. So thank you, Oxford. And it's not just the low-level jobs. Companies like Uber um, and Airbnb and the sharing economy companies have figured out how to use software to eliminate middle management jobs as well. So the whole middle management structure of Uber is gone uh, compared to a taxi organization. So in our quest to create future jobs, all existing industries uh, will be disrupted. There are no safe industries out there. If we look at the financial, the fintech area, uh, financial technologies, um, there's lots of activity there. There's over 8,000 startups that were funded by $12.5 billion just last year in venture capital money. Um, and I like to think of this as the, the, the little piranhas trying to take bites out of the giant whales. Now, what this is gonna look like 10 years from now, we still remains to be seen, because lots of the big companies are trying to partner with the little guys and lots of interesting activity there. This is the same in health tech, it's the same in lots of other industries as well. So how will the driverless car industry affect our world? I recently wrote a paper on 128 things that will disappear in the driverless car era because it's going to have a profound effect on our world. If you can imagine 10 years from now, stepping out in front of your house, pulling out your smartphone, punching in, I want to go to work, I want to go to school, I want to go shopping, a driverless car comes and picks you up, takes you to where you want to go, and from there it picks somebody else up and takes them to where they want to go. We transition from a just-in-case mindset, I have a car in my garage just in case I need to go somewhere, to a just-in-time mindset. I can summon a vehicle at any time that I need it. That changes lots of things. Lots of the driving positions start to go away. Taxi drivers, Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, courier jobs, truck drivers, valet jobs, rental cars, all these start to go away. As we enter the driverless world, we start adding um, anti-collision features, and Volvo has just announced that by 2020, they're gonna be producing death-proof cars. Now, whether or not they actually achieve it by 2020, this is an admiral direction they're heading. Making cars where people don't die, I think, is in everybody's best interest. Lots of retail stuff starts going away as well. Gas stations go away, car, car washes, oil change places. All of these, roughly 10% of all retail is car related. And so this changes the retail landscape considerably. Now, we still need all this stuff, but it ends up being a business-to-business -business operation, not a business-to-consumer play. So gas stations tend to go away. Um, parking lots, um, roughly 14% of Los Angeles is actually parking lots right now. That's a lot of valuable property that goes away. Once parking lots start going away in all these parking garages, we start putting in queuing stations in front of most buildings so that the, the driverless cars can pick people up. So lots of changes in store for us in the driverless world. So again, how long before we reach peak car? There's roughly 30 car companies working in the driverless space right now, and there's more entering almost on a daily basis. It also eliminates the human variable. So lots of things go wrong when we have humans behind the wheel. So there's lots of positive. It eliminates all the traffic accidents to death. 1.2 million deaths a year is what, uh, uh, what Greg from General Motors just told us earlier. Um, That'd be great if we could start eliminating all that. 
added freedom for seniors, handicapped people, people without driver's license, people that just can't get around very easy. So this is what an intersection will look like in a driverless car era. Kind of mesmerizing, I think. Kind of looks that way in India right now, so. As my favorite physicist, Max Planck, likes to say, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Every year, my wife and I like to go to the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. And every year, they have thousands of television sets on display there. And every year, the, the TVs get a little, little brighter, a little bigger, a little flatter, more curved screen, better battery life, more downloadable apps. So if you look at the difference in televisions from one year to the next, you won't notice much difference. But if you look at the difference from 15 years ago to today, televisions have made dramatic changes. So that for this reason, I always talk about how the iterators are often more valuable than the innovators. So the people that make the engineering changes on a day-to-day -day basis, they're the ones that make lots of the difference. So when we have a totally innovative new product, something that's totally changes, it's gonna change the world in a dramatic way, we have to work our way through the crappy stages before we get to the good stuff. And so we need the iterators, the people, the engineers that keep refining it and improving it to make it really good. Virtual technology, uh, virtual reality is a good uh, uh, example of this. We've had to put up with many years of bad virtual reality. So we're adding a digital layer of information over everything physical in the world. And as products become digital in nature, they start to, um, uh, changes start happening exponentially faster. So as an example, the solar industry today is actually only responsible for 2% of the global output of power in the world. It's a very small amount, but it's been shown to be reliably doubling every two years. So if it continues, that means within 12 years, solar will be the dominant form of power around the world. We'll see if that continues at that rate. But we're transitioning from a physical world to a digital world, from physical cars to digital cars, from physical homes to smart homes, physical cities to smart cities. As a result, innovation is being parsed into far smaller pieces. That means virtually everyone here can participate in being innovative. At the same time, communi communication is being parsed into far smaller pieces. When I was a kid, we used to write very long letters to people. Now we, all we have to do is send one, one character on a text message, that's all it takes. We're entering a world defined by scalability. I'll give you some key points here. We, in 2003, we roughly reached the, the first billion bicycles in the world. In 2010, after 120 years, we reached the first billion cars in the world. It took McDonald's 23 years to solve the first billion hamburgers. It took Facebook eight and a half years to reach the first billion users. It took Uber five and a half years to sell the first billion rides. And uh, Uber has a competitor in China, Didi Chuxing. Um, took them less than 11 months to sell the first billion rides in China. Now this isn't the record though. When you look at the number of views on YouTube, um, the person that broke the billion view record, the first is this crazy guy. It took him 157 days in 2012 to break a billion views on YouTube. He actually still holds the record um, for the number of views on YouTube. But since then, another 26 uh, YouTube stars have broken through the billion per view record um, with Adele doing in the least amount of time in 87 days. So what this means is that you can have a competitor that comes out of the woodwork and you don't know about them um, and they can have 10 million, 100 million customers, you don't know about them because they didn't exist two weeks ago. 
That's entirely possible in the future. This is a chart that shows all of the, the unicorn companies, the ones that have a billion dollar valuation, starting with 2011 on the left, going to 2015 on the right. We had 42 unicorn companies last year. We'll, we'll end up breaking that record this year. So will robots be taking all of our jobs? The answer is no. On one hand, we're eliminating jobs, but on the other hand, we're freeing up human capital. And just because our jobs are disappearing doesn't mean that we've run out of work to do in the world. That's fairly ludicrous to say that because there's plenty of work left to do in the world. So for that reason, I wrote uh, the three laws of exponential capabilities. Um, there's a lot of people that are saying that we're gonna run out of work to do, that automation is taking over. It's, it's really not that way. All this automation is giving us extra capabilities. So the first law is that with, with automation, every exponential decrease in effort creates an equal and opposite exponential increase in capabilities. I'll show you what that means. In 1850, the average transportation speed in most places around the world was roughly six kilometers an hour. Most people walking, few on horseback, few uh, riding on donkey carts. And over a lifetime, a person would travel roughly 110,000 kilometers. In 1900, um, that doubled up to 12 kilometers per hour. We had some cars, we had some trains, uh, things were speeding up. And in 1950, the average transportation speed went up to 36 kilometers per hour. In 2000, because so many people were flying, it got up to 110 kilometers per hour. And then in, if you follow the trend line in 2050, we should be averaging somewhere around, oh, 335, 340 kilometers per hour. And so how are we gonna get there? But the key thing is, is that we went in 1850 from 110,000 kilometers in our lifetime to 11.1 million in our lifetime. That's a, a hundred-fold increase in 200 years. That's a dramatic increase in capabilities. Law number two, as we raise the bar for our achievements, we also reset the norm for our expectations. And law number three, as today's significant accomplishments become more common, mega accomplishments will take their place. And I'll talk a little bit about mega projects here in a bit. So we can now think faster, know faster, and do faster than ever before in history. So where are our future jobs going to come from? They're going to come from future industries. Let's take a quick look at what these future industries are. Um, so I, I like to think about when the internet came along, the internet created this massive platform for, for creating lots of new opportunities. And then uh, a few years ago, mobile phones came along, the smartphones came along, and that created a whole new platform for creating new industries. Now I see eight different technologies that are ready to explode, each of these creating entire new platforms, each of them creating internet-sized opportunities, and each of these technologies will touch every person on the face of the earth over the coming years. So we already touched on driverless technologies. Next one is uh, the trillion sensor movement, internet of things, 3D printing, contour crafting, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, and flying drones. So the trillion sensor movement, um, Janice Berzik uh, is a vice president of Fairchild Semiconductor. Uh, three years ago, he held an event called the Trillion Sensor Summit in San Francisco, and he, he was trying to map out how long it would take before we reach a trillion sensors in the world. Uh, he concluded that we will reach a, a trillion sensors in the world somewhere between 2022 and 2024, and that by 2036, we'll have 100 trillion sensors in the world. Now what this means is that sensors are becoming very easy to mass produce, very tiny, very inexpensive, and we will start embedding sensors in everything. We'll embed sensors in paint as we paint our walls, we paint the sides of bridges, the sides of our cars. We'll embed sensors in our clothing. We will have information coming from everywhere. Well, this looks like a very simple skin patch. 
it's actually a very sophisticated piece of technology with lots of information coming and going. In 2007, when we had the first iPhone that came out, it had five sensors in it. Uh, since then, the average uh, smartphone today has roughly 19 to 20 sensors in it. So the number of sensors in smartphones is doubling every four years. The Internet of Things. We have lots of devices talking to other devices here. Uh, with the Internet of Things, we just heard earlier that we're going to reach roughly 50 billion uh, things connected to the Internet by 2020. 3D printing is going to change the world in so many uh, fundamental ways. Uh, Charles Hull is the guy that invented 3D printing uh, in the early 1980s. When he started, they were only able to print in plastics and resins. Today, they're actually able to print in thousands of different materials, including coffee grounds, cork, macadamia nut shells, uh, even wood fibers to create things that are called smart wood. The Disney Corporation has actually figured out how to print with wool to actually print entire teddy bears. If you can imagine 10 years from now going into a clothing store, the first thing you do is you step into a body scanner. Uh, as you're getting your body scanned for all the dimensions, you pick out whatever styles, fashions, and colors you're interested in, and then you can print your clothing instantly, and you can have it to wear right away, and it fits perfect every time. This is actually 3D printed clothing, uh, and we can create far more complicated fashions than ever before. And it's not just our clothing, it's also our shoes. I don't know anybody that doesn't have problems with their feet at one time or another, so being able to scan our feet and get perfectly fitting shoes that we help design, I think everybody's anxious to, to move into those days. Now, contour crafting is a form of 3D printing uh, that's going to be used in the construction industry. And in here you can see uh, a device that's actually printing one layer of concrete upon another upon another. And um, they're actually printing an entire castle here. Now, the thinking is, is that this will be used to start printing houses. Now, a couple years ago, a Chinese company called Winsun actually printed 10 houses in one day. This is fast drying concrete with fiberglass reinforcement. Um, these aren't the fanciest houses in the world, but they're very durable structures. And a few months back, then they announced that they printed this mansion, and they also printed this entire four-story building. Dubai didn't want to get left out, so they 3D printed the first office building. And this one in China actually got printed in three and a half hours. Printed an entire house in three and a half hours. So as this technology improves, the idea is not to just print the structure of the building. You can also print the rebar in the walls. You can also print the wiring in the walls, print the plumbing in the walls, uh, print the cabinets in the kitchen, the toilets in the bathrooms, the insulation in the ceiling. And sometime in the future, if you get tired of your house, all you have to do is grind it up and reprint it. Once we're able to do that, if we can actually grind up a house and reprint it in a day with all the fixtures and plumbing and everything in place, we take on a very disposable mindset in how we think about buildings. The Siemens Corporation is working on these 3D printing spider bots. Now, the way these spider bots work is they go over and they pick some like concrete out of a, a vat, and then they go climb up a wall and put it in place, and then they go down and get another uh, source of concrete, and then take it up and put that in place. And as these spider bots start working, it's not just one spider bot doing all of this. It ends up being 150, 200 spider bots working in unison, um, actually as a swarm to build really large projects. And so it's not just building houses, we can actually build baseball stadiums and hospitals, um, the really large things. Once we're able to 3D print our walls, we no longer have the need for flat walls. Every wall can become an artistic centerpiece. Architects are gonna love this because they can create freeform structures unlike anything we have today. 
And it's not just about printing with concrete. We can also print with steel. We can print with glass. We can print with wood. We can print all of these things together very fast. Our very definition of what a house is, what a condo is, what an office is, is going to change as we have this type of capability to design and build quickly in the future. And architects are going to get, go very crazy with their new designs. We can even get into the really big things like floating islands. Jeff Bezos says that if you, if you only do things where you know the answer in advance, your company will never, never succeed. Virtual reality. I'll show you a quick video here. What if we could go beyond the screen? where your digital world is blended with your real world. Now we can. This is the world with holograms. What will they enable us to do? New ways to visualize our work. I have an idea for the fuel tank. New ways to share ideas with each other. How are things going your end? I just put the images in one drive. Perfect. More immersive ways to play. New ways to teach and learn. So put the new trap in the place of the old one. Now what? And tighten here and here. Now, flying drones are going to invade our lives in lots of different ways. We hear a lot about delivery drones. There's lots of problems with delivery drones, and so that's going to take a lot longer than most people are thinking. So having ground-based delivery drones is radically different than flying delivery drones, and this is going to be much more prevalent than, uh, than people realize. So the, the market for driverless delivery vehicles will grow long before the auto industry has peaked. We'll actually reach a billion drones in the world somewhere around 2030 to 2032. Drones are good for doing things that are hard for people to get to. I mean, like inspecting the tops of windmills, uh, tops of power lines, uh, dangerous places that are hard to get to. We can do thermal scans on buildings, scan for structural integrity. Uh, we can monitor construction projects on the other side of the world. We can actually monitor crops growing on the other side of the world. Agriculture is going to be one of the early adopters of drones. Yes, we can apply herbicides and pesticides with drones, but a few scans over a field will tell us how much fertilizer is needed in different parts of the field, how much water is on different parts of the field, where the diseases, the bugs are, and we can actually rescue our livestock with it. But drones can also roll along the ground. They can also stick to the side of a building. Uh, they can float in a river, dive underwater. They can jump onto the side of a building, and I've seen them jump onto the sides of two-story buildings. They can climb a tree, and they can attach themselves like parasites to the sides of train ships and airplanes. So drones in the future are going to have multiple capabilities. It's not just flying drones. There's actually three different companies that I know of that are working on drones large enough to actually haul shipping containers, from point A to point B, and one of them, this one here, is actually trying to build one large enough to move houses as well. Uh, on the other side of the spectrum, there's people warning us now that in the future, drones are going to be so small that we have to keep our windows shut so they don't get in like mosquitoes do. Artificial intelligence is going to invade our lives in lots of different ways. We currently don't know what the limits are right now. 
I like to think of it as adding hot and cold running artificial intelligence to everything that we're doing. This is being fueled by lots of different industries right now, and it's all feeding the artificial intelligence world. Um, so some of the areas that are going to thrive with the new AI era, uh, healthcare, power, energy, driverless vehicles, the Internet of Things, 3D printing, all of the ones that we just heard about. But the future of steel is going to be defined by mega projects. Lots of global mega projects. Infrastructure projects represent a, a huge payday for somebody, usually many someones, and the disruptors are determined to make the, their payday. By 2030, we'll see more changes to core infrastructure than in the combined total of human history. I'm, I'm going to stretch your imagination a little bit here with some uh, projects that don't get talked about very much, but this is the type of global um, mega projects that uh, are going to be important over the coming years. So I'll talk about four different bridge projects. One is the, over the Bering Strait, one is over the Darien Gap, um, one between Korea and Japan, uh, the Friendship Tunnel, and then also the one, uh, the Gibraltar Tunnel, that connects Europe and Africa. So the Bering Strait, it's a proposed bridge tunnel system. Uh, yes, it's, it's quite, uh, quite the engineering feat, but it won't be impossible. It's not that long a distance. There are two islands in the middle that could support, uh, support this. And whether it goes underground or overground remains to be seen. In 1937, all the countries in North and South America signed on to the Pan American Highway uh, Accord and the whole thing was constructed except for this little section in the middle called the Darien Gap. Oh, it's about oh, 35 kilometers long between Panama and Colombia. It's an environmentally sensitive area. Now the one between uh, Korea and Japan, also a great engineering feat, but it's not impossible. There are several islands in the middle. And a Gibraltar tunnel would actually connect Europe with uh, Africa. So all of this makes a much more connected world if we look at major problems like projects like this. Now, these are 10 of the biggest um, mega projects going on in the world today. Um, uh, so as you can see, the, the second one is here in Korea, right, right in this area. <clears throat> um, the Dubai World Center, um, Maglev train in Japan, there's lots of mega projects underway, and, there's, and the number are going to be increasing dramatically. This is Lusail City in Qatar. It's a $45 billion city that they're building. Um, the, the Grand Cancun is a floating island. The Pearl is in Qatar, a $15 billion artificial island. And in India, they're actually looking at building the world's tallest statue, a statue of Sartar Patel. So why are mega projects important? Currently, mega projects represent 8% of global GDP. Um, lots of things, the, the mega city trend that we're looking at is actually increasing the demand for more infrastructure and more other projects. Uh, it looks to me like by 2030 or 2035, roughly this number is going to triple. So what that would mean is tripling to 24% of GDP by 2030. Now I'll mention one last global infrastructure project. This is the, um, this is the everybody hears about Hyperloop. Well, there's actually two competing systems, Hyperloop and ET3. And we currently ship more things by, by pipe than uh, any other form of transport. We ship water, we sewage. Uh, ship oil, and so why not people and freight? And so tube transportation has, has great potential in the future. One of the, the Hyperloop groups headed up by Dick Alborn, Hyperloop One has already launched in a major effort. They've raised over $100 million so far. This is a test they ran earlier this year uh, to show kind of how it will work.
that didn't quite achieve the speed that they had hoped it would. Um, the people at UCLA actually created an animation as to how Hyperloop would work. They, they're actually looking at bus-sized vehicles that would seat 28 people. Um, this is a large, uh, large vehicle and re would require very large tubes. So how is this going to evolve in the future? Actually, tube transportation looks to be the future of transportation. It looks like in the long run, we can get places much more quickly. So roughly 1,100 kilometers per hour with, uh, with, with Hyperloop, a little over 6,000 kilometers an hour with ET3. Um, so what will these vehicles look like? That remains uh, to be seen. Uh, lots, of, lots of artwork being done right now on this. But it's going to require lots and lots of tubes. Some of the projections I've seen that show that over the next 50 years, it could be as much as a million kilometers of tubing that's stretched out over the world. Would that be a big project for the steel industry? Yeah, it sure could be. As uh, Daryl Oster likes to refer to this from ET3, he says this is space travel on Earth. And so some of them could be the large vehicles that could actually sh hold shipping containers. Other ones are more car size like vehicles. So Hyperloop would do New York to Beijing or New York to Seoul in roughly eight hours. ET3 would actually do New York to Seoul in actually two hours. So this has the potential to be the world's largest infrastructure project of all times. 50, 70 year build out employing hundreds of millions of people, massive investment, trillions of dollars, but it pays for itself as it goes. As I like to say, it's we shape our future and then our future shapes us. The future is ours to write. I'm gonna leave you with a few predictions. The next major league sport is going to be video games. They're actually looking at turning this into an Olympic sport. We'll see. Our most valuable land in the future will be our landfills. That's where we put all of our natural resources in the landfills. So in the future, we're going to create artificial earthworms that go through there and mine out all the valuable resources and, and put them back into use. Driverless cars are gonna change transportation as dramatically as the invention of the automobile itself. I, I firmly agree with that. By 2030, the average person will own printed clothing, live in a printed house, have packages delivered by drones, or own more than one robot, will work as a freelancer, frequently use a driverless car, and will be capable of accomplishing 10 times as much as the average person today. So we're entering into a period of unprecedented opportunity. Why is this so important? Because humanity is going to change more in the next 20 years than in all human history. At the same time, we have lots of risk factors, lots of things that can break along the way. Uh, so risk factors will increase exponentially. And our children's children, who haven't even been born yet, are counting on you. So we're being judged by the future. As Steve Jobs says, right now is one of those moments when you are influencing the future. But sometimes, even our best efforts just look a lot like this. See, this wouldn't happen if they had better steel. Thomas Edison says, opportunity is missed by most people because it's dressed in overalls and looks like work. So any of you that want more information about what we do at the Da Vinci Institute, Feel free to sign up for our free newsletter. And I thank you very much for having me here today. Thank you very much. 네, 여러분, 프레이 박사님께 다시 한번 큰 박수 부탁드립니다. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Frey, for that very interesting and intriguing presentation and for sharing your insight and vision.